Hi everyone, all of you seekers of truth and understanding uh, out there uh, joining in these conversations, at least in a metaphorical sense. Today's brilliant guest is someone I've spoken to before. I've had the pleasure of uh, 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 absorbing a certain amount of his wisdom and now is an opportunity uh, to help ourselves to some more. It's an ongoing conversation about the world's most valuable commodities and how and why they're exploited by our species for good and for ill. It'll be a fascinating conversation. But before we get started, please let me remind you to get involved with this content. Uh, click the subscribe button where you see it and get across to patreon.com and look for me by name and become a subscriber there also. Uh, it's the financial support that comes via Patreon that really is the, the, the beating heart of, of this channel. It costs about the price of a cup of coffee every month, but you get early access to my content, you get exclusive access to some content. It's a great site, so stir yourself into the mix and make it better by being there. Okay, now let's get to that interview. Hi everyone, fellow travellers, it's time for another fascinating and illuminating conversation with someone worth listening to. My guest today is Nick Ward, uh, founder and director of Gold Bullion Partners, which is a company that does exactly what it sounds like on the tin, uh, involved in the in that marketplace of, of, of precious metals. Nick and I had a, a, a conversation oh, some weeks ago. Now we got a great response from it. It touched on may, it touched many people for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, so I thought it was high time we get Nick back uh, to follow up and, and develop a lot of the thoughts that we only just opened the door on last time. Uh, good morning to you, Nick. Morning, Neil. No, thanks very much for having me on again. I. Um... I know there was so much we, we didn't cover in particular on the last call. Uh, <laughs> in relation to silver, we didn't even touch on that. So uh, I wanted to, to go over what we're seeing in the market, um, what's happening there, because it's a hell of a lot worse than, than what we're seeing with gold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's, there's so much going on. The news schedules are full. Mm. Uh, there's so much going on. There are so many things that, that we're all being invited to at least look at, if not be completely distracted by... Uh, and over the last few years, I've learned to be uh, mindful in those times. Uh, if, we're look, if we're supposed to look at that, what are we not looking at? Look Is the other way every yeah. time, yeah. So, so <laughs> as, as you rightly say, I mean, pe people are definitely have been waking up to the idea about um, real value, about, you know, the, about the, 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 you know, the, the sense of, of paying attention to gold and silver. We concentrated on gold last time, but you've made it plain that there's so much about silver, that element, that we, the public, we, the general public, are definitely invited not to know and not to ask about. So I don't know if you just want to get into some of why your attention is so focused on that metal. Yeah, absolutely, Neil. So look, silver really is at the heart of one of the most hidden yet powerful financial manipulations we've seen of our time. So there's a quiet conspiracy on a global scale, this is, that, that's nearing breaking point. And I wanted to, to pull back the curtain for your audience on how this has basically come about uh, and what it means for the future. So people have to realize to start, there's only eight commercial banks in the West that control the entire market. Um, and they hold the largest, most concentrated position against silver we've ever seen in any commodity at any time in history. Nobody knows it. Um, but what they're essentially doing is driving the price of silver down and suppressing it for as long as they possibly can, all the while um, they're quietly trying to stockpile it for themselves. Um, and just to give your, your audience a bit of historical background, I suppose, I think it's really important to understand how this, is, how this has come about and how it's happening. But it really goes back to 1986 under the Thatcher government when they introduced the, the big bang, the, the financial reform legislation, which gave oversight of the London gold and silver markets, which were the majority of the global trading um, uh, volumes for, for decades. They gave it to the Bank of England, who obviously owned the money printers. So you think, oh, that's a bit odd, as obviously gold and silver uh, have historically always been the, the warning signs of the central bankers and of inflation. So 
back then interest rates were not actually driven by the the rate of inflation they were calculated by the the price level which was best determined by the price of gold so in the 1970s we saw the gold price go up a thousand percent silver went up two thousand four hundred percent as inflation was running rampant and the bank of england quickly realized that in order to take away this limiting device of sorts now what they do is they convert the trading of metal into paper promissory notes so not backed by anything so they basically put the fox in charge of the hen house if you like and in 1987 the lbma was created so the london bullion market association it was created by the bank of england and 90 percent of the the daily trading that was occurring on that um, was now paper so basically as a consequence there there was no limit as to how much they could actually trade or how much they could create out of thin air now in theory that's okay um if you have sufficient metal to back it up but as soon as you have a shortage um you obviously run the risk of default when you lose control of that paper pricing mechanism now just <laughs> just to give does, you an does idea it mean, does it mean nick i mean no i uh, uh, for my own, for, just so that I make sure that I'm following this properly, mm. in this is it that it's not just the case that we have a we have a fiat, we have fiat currencies that are backed by nothing, mm -hmm. that the that only have a notional value uh, held up by the confidence or lack thereof in that currency, but there's nothing real about it. At the same time, and not disconnected from it the value of gold and the value of silver are not allowed to have, are not being allowed to have their natural market driven value. Exactly they are being that. deliberately manipulated down as part of this broader uh, pushing of a misunderstanding in the minds of most of us about what's really worth having. Absolutely. Yeah. They've rehypothecated um, that industry as well. Um, and they've just created these paper contracts that are backed by nothing. It's exactly like the banking industry, just, just in the metals industry. It's identical. Um, they are not backed by anything. And the numbers that, that are actually traded here in London are insane. I mean, at busy times, the LBMA, I think it's about 290 million ounces, Neil, of silver they're trading on a daily basis. So, OK, that's fine, but it's not the entire picture. Um, the LBMA did a survey, I think it was back in 2011 or 2012. And only two thirds of banks, by the way, even bothered responding to it. And we don't even know whether it was the bigger ones or not. But they themselves admitted back then that the volume of those paper contracts that you mentioned, it's 10 times what they publish. So if you buy 15 contracts, you sell 10. Well, technically, you've, you've traded 25, but they class it as only five as they net them off. So if you want to extrapolate that out, that's 2.9 billion ounces that are being traded every day. Every day, 2.9 billion ounces. And that's three and a half times the yearly supply. It's insane. You can't even get your, your head around those type of numbers. So if you want to look at it on a paper contract basis, Neil, that's 400 contracts for every ounce of gold that they actually own. And in the market, you might hear people say naked shorting. There's a big film called The Big Short, etc. But these are naked trades. And what they're doing is they're shorting the market with these fake trades to keep it lower. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Is there, is there any way in that, in that fog to, to, have a, to get a sense of what silver is actually worth? Mm. What, what, is, what is the value of silver that we're being told at the moment? And and in a, in a in a level playing field, what what ought it to be worth? Oh gosh, that's a really really oh, good I, question. <laughs> what is what uh, is the what is the what is the price of silver, and what does it what is how does that relate to the price of gold, and and so on and so on? Yeah. Now, look, I try and avoid always doing price predictions. I mean, it's a bit of a mugs game, um, but. I generally think the price of it's going to be completely revalued as this debt-based Ponzi. It's going to collapse. We all know that. I mean, it's it's a miracle metal. It's got so many industrial uses that we can come on to uh, in a minute. But just to put things into perspective to answer your question there, I suppose, 
silver's sitting at about a 30 percent discount below its 1980 high obviously when the hunt brothers you might remember that neil when they cornered the market it was about 50 dollars back then so the purchasing power of 50 dollars in 1980 is the equivalent of about 1750 1800 now in real inflation adjusted terms and that's because there's 35 times more debt in the global economy relative to 1980. So back then it was 1 trillion. Now it's 35 trillion. So not only have you got all that debt, there's a lot less silver as well. So look, you could be sitting at a, a minimum of $300, $400 an ounce. Even if you go back to ancient history, the, the ratio between gold and silver was 16 to 1. I know we touched upon that briefly in the last conversation. Um, but if you look at the value of a Spanish piece of eight or the Roman denarius, you look at how much that would be worth now, you're probably close to £150 an ounce. So there are, there are lots of different perspectives and prices we can use in the past, whether it's recent or ancient history, but we know it should be worth a hell of a lot more than it is at the moment. People, the general, the general trusting population don't have, aren't invited or are not, certainly not educated even to contemplate the reality that the, the price of things like mm -hmm. gold and silver is completely, it's just what someone says it is. It's just a, a manipulated number and it's manipulated not for our benefit, but for someone else's. Absolutely that. There's no doubt about it. Um, just to give you some disparity as, as to the price and what we're seeing in the market, if you just first of all, look at the disparity between gold and silver. The silver held in, in the London vaults at the moment is about 820 million ounces, which is 3.5% of the total amount of gold held in London. It's a tiny, tiny little market so that they can so easily suppress it. Like I said earlier, it's the most concentrated in the world. And most of it in London is actually gone. So the banks now realize this artificial game is up and they're going to other areas of the world to try and source it. So even, I think it was back in April, Neil, earlier this year, they showed up in China um, looking for further cooperation with the Chinese, the Shanghai um, Gold Exchange. Deutsche Bank, Standard Chartered, HSBC, JP Morgan, they all turned up looking for that cooperation. We know full well um, they weren't. They're actually looking for silver because they've run out of it. And the Chinese took great pleasure in, in posting photos of them on social media, almost trolling them. So we know something's cooking because that, that price is completely out of skew. Um, Jamie Dimon, Neil, he was over there um, this year. First time he's been over there in four years. And at the same time, he miraculously came out and said that he's taking early retirement. I mean, make of that what we will. But we know because of this artificial price discrepancy, they're in big, big trouble because there isn't enough of the physical metal to satisfy all these paper contracts. And I even saw earlier, um, a few months ago, Neil, the uh, Bank of America, there's rumor in the market they've got a one billion ounce short position with these contracts. And that's over a whole year's worth of production in the market. And that's so, that's 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 silver that they have in inverted commas sold to people that yes, doesn't it, exist. It doesn't exist. So if the silver price were to move up, let's say it moves up ten dollars, they'd be sitting on about a hundred billion loss. They could implode, they could collapse overnight just on their silver trade. So I don't think it's a, a coincidence when some of these financial bigwigs are, are abruptly selling their stock over the last eight weeks. Warren Buffett, look what he's just done. He's always been a supporter of the banks back in 2008. We know that he, he bailed them out. So what he's has he done? Sold. What has Warren Buffett done? He just sold a huge sway the Bank of America stock, which is coinciding with exactly the same time that all the banks are trying to go out there and get silver. Now, I can't put a direct link together, but there's no smoke without fire. It almost, it almost sounds like the analogy that comes to my mind is that, you know, it, it, it's like they're, if you have a petrol driven car, you need petrol and that they've got their foot to the floor driving flat out and the <laughs> tank is just empty yeah. and they've got to get they've got to get to a filling station somewhere and get <laughs> some gas in the tank oh that's a really good analogy i'm going to use that actually in the future exactly that um 
And look, this isn't just me saying it or the market talking about it. It's been evidenced by multiple regulatory investigations, lawsuits, settlements. JP Morgan, were they've received the largest fine in history by the Justice Department. 920 million. That's almost a billion um, for manipulating the market. But this was all just swept under the carpet. No one's talking about it. Julian Assange in WikiLeaks, Neil, um, there was a dump of classified government cables going all the way back to the 70s, where they even admit that by allowing these paper short positions and transactions without actually having the delivery to back it up, it's designed to deter the public from physically storing and buying bullion um, and to what, negate what, their enthusiasm. What basically. blows my mind is that if you or I, well, if, 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 a, if, if Joe Public was to set up a business model like that, their feet wouldn't touch the floor before they were in jail. Nope. You know, if you're if you're selling something that you and and persuade confidence, tricking people into thinking they now own something that doesn't exist. That is one one rule for thee and one rule for me. It's just classic. We've seen this so many times throughout well, history. I, I, I suppose before any more uh, time on this conversation goes past, we should probably address why is the world physically consuming so much silver? Mm. You That's know, really what, where is that? Where is that gas in the tank being? What's it being burnt on? Exactly. Yeah, I think that leads on nicely. I mean, look, silver's the second most versatile, versatile commodity in the world next only to oil. Um, it's got 10,000 industrial uses as it's the most efficient conductor of electricity that we actually have on the planet. So it's essential for power transmission and the, the internet of things that we keep hearing about, whether it's AI, 5G, antennas, connectors, circuit boards. It ensures that high speed data can, can be transmitted, Neil, um, with, with minimal signal loss. So it's the only thing that can do it. Uh, and as for the, the demand, um, that's just growing as, as technology speeds up, things get faster, all these devices become interconnected, et cetera. So, I mean, a really interesting statistic I heard the other day, Neil, AI, I don't know whether you've used ChatGBT yet, but it uses eight times as much electricity as a standard Google search. Incredible. Um, so there's huge industrial demand for it there, but it's also coming from electric car batteries, solar panels. I mean, solar alone's um, predicted to use 20% of annual silver supply by 2027, basically two years out. Um, it, it's the most reflective metal that we've got, again, on the planet. And at this current rate, solar panel production is predicted to use almost 100% of our current inventory by 2025. So no wonder the likes of BlackRock and Larry Fink, they've started to purchase huge sums of it over the last year. There's obviously they're the ones that, that are pushing this, um, this whole ESG narrative. Whether you, whatever you think of the green insanity, I know I've got my opinion on it, but silver certainly recession proof as it's being incentivized by all these, uh, by all these governments um, throughout the world. Based on a geological survey and estimates and all of the rest of it, and the, you know, however much, is there enough silver on planet Earth to to sustain oh, a rate of consumption like this in relation to renewable energy and, and the, the Internet of Things and munitions and all of the rest of it? No, absolutely not. So the supply side of the equation it is so important here, too, because it peaked out in 2016. So the supply in the ground is de depleting really rapidly and it's not being replaced. So new deposit discoveries, Neil, um, they've fallen about 50% in the last decade. Um, the development time for a new mine is about 10 to 12 years. And the other thing is silver is mainly produced as a byproduct of mining, um, mining other metals, whether it's lead, zinc, copper, you name it. So making any rapid discovery um, is really, really difficult because only a quarter of it actually comes from silver mines. I, I, again, I don't want to get I'm a bit of a geek with it, Neil, but it's found in nature epithermally, so right near the top of the crust, just like the epidermis of your skin, if you like. So the big deposits were mined years and years ago. Um, it's disappearing in nature, and it's, it's harder and harder to find. So again, it used to be 1 to 16. Then the mining production dropped to 1 to 12. Now it's 1 to 6. And you've got to look at it. There's um, oh, Eagle Pitcher, leading manufacturer of batteries in the US. Um, they, they came out about a year ago and said there's a massive supply shortage 
um, and it's becoming a huge concern for them because there's a threat to national security, etc. And of course, most of the, the silver for America, at least, is coming from Mexico. And this is another rabbit hole we can dive down if you like. But they're the, the world's largest silver producer. And, and there's, there's an argument to say that they stand on the brink of just becoming a global superpower if they were to just nationalize their industry. 25% of the world's supply. They're not a member of the BRICS yet. I know we spoke about that previously. They've expressed an interest in it. Um, but if you look at it objectively, this should be a cornerstone of prosperity for their country. Um, but at the moment, that silver supply is just lining the pockets of mining companies, um, foreign investors, etc. It, it's endlessly fascinating to me to be reminded in this way of the of physical reality. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we're, we're invited to think in so many ways that you know the, the internet, artificial intelligence, energy itself. It, can almost be conjured up from nothing. And, and to be reminded in this way that it comes down to, if you want to conduct electricity, however you're generating it, you need silver. And yep. there's only so much silver on the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and, unless and until Elon Musk and his ilk start accessing silver in outer space, <laughs> whatever, from, from asteroids or on the moon, there's no more silver coming. Nope. Not at all. There's none left. I mean, uh, to, to mention Elon Musk, I mean, he buys loads of it for his Teslas, Neil. Absolutely loads. And one of his friends even joked that he should actually consider buying a silver mine itself just to guarantee that supply. And that's not to even mention what Samsung, I think, are doing. They've just developed a um, silver solid state battery, completely revolutionary technology. This thing on a nine minute charge can go 600 miles. It leaves Tesla in the dirt. And that's made out of solid silver. So nothing else can do this. And obviously, the Americans have cottoned on to this. They have done for a while. Um, look, Mexico, going back to Mexico again, their president, AMLO, earlier this year, he was talking about nationalizing their silver and, and taking back, regaining their silver sovereignty, um, which obviously aligns with their strategy of just becoming more independent. They, they already nationalized lithium, by the way, which is currently conducting a lot of electricity in these batteries. But he was really popular with a lot of Mexicans. They saw him as the people's president, etc. cetera. Um, but look, if he was to go and nationalize those mines, um, there, there could be a huge, huge supply shortage of it again. Um, there's, I think there's, just, there's such an interesting historical precedent for it. When the, when the Spanish and the Portuguese, mm -hmm. the Americas in the 15th century, shortly thereafter, they found a mountain of gold. That, that when they started shipping it back to Europe, it was it, it was as much silver arriving that, that had been circulating in Europe for centuries. Mm -hmm. Completely destabilised that because suddenly there was twice as much silver. Yeah, all, all by all by they found a mountain of silver, a, a, a solid mountain of this stuff. And just started shoveling it back, just started <laughs> shoveling it back to Madrid, and and, and so on and so on. And they came up with all manner of excuses as to why they needed to, to go and invade uh, over there and, and obviously take we're, over that continent. We're, we're, not, we're not, as a species, we are not contemplating far less addressing finite resource, are we? I mean, that, you know, when it comes to everything is finite, well, you know, certain things, you know, you know return, you know, what water returns to us relatively quickly because it doesn't leave. But, you know, the silver that we vaporise, you know, every time a smart bomb detonates somewhere, is not going to come back. It's, it's, almost it's still there, but it's not going to get it's not going to get crystallized back into this crust to be made available again for a very, very long time. No, not at all. You, you can't. You technically you can recycle it but with current technology. It's almost impossible. You're right. It's vaporized. Now, I know this is we're recording this off the back of the election. Um, Trump's obviously just got in, Neil. But what's so, so important to link all of this together is the rhetoric that we were seeing before he won coming from the Republican Party about the need to invade or bomb Mexico to suppress the cartels, of course. Trump's fantasized about it. There's even a number of moderate Republicans comparing them to ISIS already. Now, where have we heard all of that before? Manufacturing a crisis over a strategic resource. Uh -huh. So I'm not saying, again, this is definitely going to happen. They've certainly been speaking about it. The thing is, AMLO, he's now just gone. He's been replaced. 
by a new president called um, Claudia Scheinbaum. Um, this was back in September. The thing is, she's just taken over in a week before the election. Who was she seen having secretive meetings with and being pictured with? Larry Fink over at BlackRock. And she's a WEF candidate in an election where 37 people were murdered. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. I just don't know. But it certainly makes you think. How much of a difference do you think it would make if, if the, the substance of this conversation we're having now was general parlance? You know, if, if, the, if this was the, if this, let's say, the availability of silver, given how much it matters to technology, to the military industrial complex, you know, how much difference would that make if we weren't allowing ourselves all the time to be distracted by whatever we're given? And we were actually paying attention to things like gold, silver, why it matters. Oh, it, it, it matters so, so much because going back to a hard money standard is going to end up, it's going to enable society to prosper again, get back to a end usury for a start, because that's what's keeping so many people on the hamster wheel by having their savings inflated away through the back door in terms of inflation. Um, the whole current system of just rehypothecation is designed to keep you down in your place and not raise your head above the parapet. They pull up the ladder uh, and then they can sit in their ivory tower and look down on you. It's just all about control. I mean, ever since the establishment of the Federal Reserve, and uh, I know we've, we've touched upon that. But I think another reason, yes, it's economical and it benefits the Ponzi scheme to a allow them to suppress the price of it. But there's another elephant in the room Neil that they are not talking about at all and it's something I really wanted to, to discuss with you and this is the military industrial complex and it's linked to all of this and and the, the veil of secrecy that they've got about their usage of silver um, it, it's now estimated to be worth 15 times more than the industrial and the investment demand put together so everything we've just been talking about about the electricity and the internet of things, everything else, it pales in comparison, in comparison to what the, the military are doing. And I've done some digging, Neil, and the US Geological Survey, they completely omit military usage for, for the metal. Why, why are they doing that? The, the US, um, the Department of Defense, they stopped the reporting of silver usage in the military back in uh, 1995. So that's Rockets, missiles, fighter jets, submarines, satellites, radars, nuclear weapons, you name it, everything. Um, all of them you use a huge amount uh, of silver. And to treat them with a healthy degree of suspicion as well, I don't think is unjustified because you've just got to look back to what they did in, um, in the early 40s with the Manhattan Project. So just for anyone that doesn't know what that is, it's when they, they tried to create the first atomic bomb. So... In complete secrecy, the department, um, the War Department, they removed 14,000 tons of America's silver bars from their vault without telling the government and turned them into magnetic coils for these bombs. 14,000 tons back then. The Russians have only got 92 at the moment. And to think that's 80 years ago. I mean, technology's come on in leaps and bounds now. And there's hardly any data, but I've, I've been siphoning through it. And some of the data leaks um, and interviews that people have done in the industry are really, really interesting. Um, obviously, a lot of them are anonymous. You can't verify them, etc. But <laughs> funnily enough, torpedoes appear to use the most silver for their weight because obviously they've got to go at really extreme um, speeds and distances underwater. They think that each torpedo, large torpedo, uses 11,000 uh, sorry, 11,000 ounces of silver each. And the smaller ones are about a thousand, one thousand two hundred. And when that, and when that, when that torpedo detonates, that that silver, that eleven thousand, is got is effectively gone. Absolutely, that's not even above ground. So once that's underwater, that's that's definitely gone now. So that market, and that market, by the way, by I think it's like twenty thirty two or something. That's due to reach about six billion dollars. So there's no insight end in sight for that one. Another really interesting one as well is missiles. So forget all the other hundreds of weapons that we'd have no idea about, the radar or the satellites that are hovering above us. In a conventional Tomahawk missile, they use about 500 ounces of silver. Again, you can't completely verify it, 
but that this is common knowledge in the market. And that's due to the battery technology required to actually launch them. Um, what's really interesting now is we've got the advent of some the, the, the advent of something called a hypersonic missile. And these things can travel at Mach 13. They are insanely fast. Uh, and they're estimated to use 5,000 ounces of silver each. Now, in recent history, let's go back a month. Let's have a look at what happened with Iran and Israel. Uh, differing reports again in the media. I suppose we can come on to that. But Iran launched, they said they launched about 400 rockets into Israel in, in retaliation for that Hezbollah assassination. Listen to the mainstream media over in America, downplayed, oh, it failed, it didn't do anything, it was a damp squid. Fine. Um, but these, these missiles were capable of bypassing our uh, uh, def uh, air defense, the Jordanian air defense, the US defense, and the Israeli defenses to hit these sensitive bases in Israel. And what these were, they were fatter hyperso hypersonic missiles. And they're only capable of reaching Mach 13, so 10,000 miles an hour, Neil, um, because they've got silver in them. They can, they can actually change direction in flight now. It's incredible what these things can do. But these speeds and this torque, it generates such extreme heat and stress. Only silver allows for that, for that thermal and um, con connectivity. So again, I just want to caveat this with these figures are speculative. We know we have no idea how many rockets the Iranians have got. We've got no idea what they're developing either. But this was one attack. We, uh, who knows what every other country has got? It, it's almost paradoxical in that you, you could envision a time when all the silver, to all intents and purposes, was locked up in arsenals of these super weapons. Which would mean that if they were to be used, they're irreplaceable. You, you, you know, hypothetically, you get to a point where the superpowers have stockpiled effectively all the available silver into rounds of ammunition. Yeah, and that if they if they use that ammunition to prosecute whatever war they have in mind, they're going to have to use something else for the next assault. Do you know it's. Yeah. Because it's ultimately, it's hard to put timelines on it. And as you say, it only, can only be speculative about how much, how many units of silver are in each missile. But nonetheless, you're talking about the consumption of a finite resource. Absolutely. It's not like gold that just sits in vaults for decades. Silver is not only a monetary metal, it's being consumed as well. And most of it, if it goes into weapons, can't be harvested back. It's gone. And then I uh, know we've just touched upon Israel uh, there, but it just look at, look more domestically in our, our own situation with Ukraine. So this conflict is being heavily pushed by the city of London, no matter what anybody says. They're obviously running this paper scheme. Um, the majority of the city's operators, Cameron, Sunak, warmongers, from the very start, they are trying to maximise that conflict. They've got no no interest in trying to come up with some solution. I mean, Johnson even scuttled uh, a peace deal at the beginning of the war. Now, if you look at all the mun munitions we're shipping over there, all the anti-tank weapons, enriched uranium, etc. Again, all of that, a lot of it has got silver in it that's just be that's vanishing as well. So again, I can't find a direct link to that, obviously, but <laughs> it raises a lot of questions. And I mean, it goes without saying, but we have to touch on it. It's This is not being reported it's, it's certainly not in the in the relic uh, legacy media, and you know here we are here we are in the alternative to that. But I'm I've never heard this conversation before. No, and I'm interested. Anyway. I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and, and I'm not and I'm not consuming this content. You know, where where is yeah. the media? Because you know th th there are so many things. Obviously, uh, you know the the election of of Donald Trump is is compelling attentions all, all around the world and people are you know are rightly and understandably speculating about what that must mean here there and everywhere but at the same time something like this the the, the military industrial complex's interest in and hand over fist consumption of a finite resource you've got to pay attention to it especially when you say now where is where are the biggest resources of it well they're in south america now let's watch South America and the rest of the world's attention on South America through that lens, the silver uh, lens. 
Absolutely. Like you said at the very beginning, Neil, the media will try and get you to look one direction. You've always got to look at the parallel opposite. Uh -huh. it, it's insane. Now, look, to answer your question there, have they had a tap on the, on the shoulder of the media by the Department of Defense because of national security? Maybe. I think that's really likely. But again, there's also a massive intertwining between the defense contractors and the media conglomerates. Just look at General Electric. Uh, Electric. They were a major defense contractor and manufacturer of aircraft parts and missiles. And they owned NBC for nearly three decades until about 2013, I think it was. Um, Westinghouse Electric Corporation. They had substantial de defense contracts, which I think they they've sold to Northrop Grumman now. Um, but they owned CBS in the mid-90s. You've just got to ask yourself whether the financial interests of these companies with the defense contractors, whether they sway the editorial decisions or shape the narratives on the war reporting. And if it affects their bottom line, are they going to think twice about downplaying something like this? I, I don't think so. And it might you, not be as overt, Neil, but they're, they've all got members on each other's boards. Um, you, they're all advertising with each other. Do you hear uh, any speculation? You know, you're saying at the moment, you know, only silver can do X, Y and Z. Uh, and you mentioned, I think lithium, uh, you know, has has you know has uh, conductive qualities that make it desirable by some of the same people for a lot of the same reasons. Do you hear any speculation that there is any fallback position? Once we've used up all the silver, and once we've burnt up all the lithium, we've got we hear about you know technologies that are twenty and fifty years ahead of what the public are invited to know about. Yeah, you know, are there supersonic missiles, hypersonic missiles out there that are actually flying with something else on board? Look, it's I, just I, a speculation. I, I know, but do you hear? Do you hear gossip? Do you hear? You know, do you hear uh, tremors in the wires? I no, I not that I know of, and you're absolutely right. We only get to find out about technology. 30, Afterwards. 40, 50 years when they've <laughs> already got it. I mean, look, they probably had chat GBT for 20 odd years already. Uh -huh. And you see these reports of these Tic Tacs and everything flying around. Who knows? I don't know. But mm -hmm. the military industrial complex wouldn't need to keep it quiet and the banks wouldn't need to smash the price of it down if it wasn't valuable. They know uh -huh. something's up. They really yeah. do. But I suppose to get to brass tacks or silver tacks, what, what then are, are the realities for people that are looking at uh, metals and looking at that market, you know, in terms of where prices are, you know, where prices might go. I mean, it's all just speculation, but that then is a speculative industry by definition. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. What are the reality? You know, if people are paying attention and contemplating how to, uh, in this, you know, world which feels like a swamp for value, everything just seems to get sucked down into the inflationary swamp. Yeah. And people that are looking for any way in which to secure the value of their effort. Absolutely. And people are doing this for long term wealth preservation. It's protecting what you're lucky enough to have. That's why people buy gold and silver. But you're right. Uh, a rising tide lifts all assets to an extent. The thing is, silver's a hell of a lot more sensitive to inflation than every other asset as well. That's why in the 70s, nearly it went up 2,400 percent at its peak. Gold only went up a thousand percent. It's incredible. No wonder they needed to, to keep it down because they could probably see what was coming years and years ago with all this uh, technology usage that, that we're now seeing used. I mean, would the, so, is there any are there any mechanisms by which any exposure of of, the, of reality that would that would permit silver and indeed gold to to reach what are their actual values? Whatever yeah, an actual think... value is, would it, would anything would anything stop that suppression takes a lot of effort. You know, yeah. holding something down is an enervating effort. Yeah, it is. There's only so it's like holding a beach ball down, I suppose, underneath the water. There's only so long you can do it until it launches up dramatically. Uh -huh. I've seen it with in the past. But if you adjust that 1980 high for inflation, I think it would make silver about 500 pounds an ounce. Um, and it's at the it, moment it's. Seven, it's sitting at a 70% discount from its fiat price back then. So it's about, is it about what, 25, 30 pounds an ounce? Yeah, 30 like odd pounds. That. Yeah, exactly that. If you were to try and buy yourself a one ounce coin, Neil, yeah, exactly. The total amount of money is up 35x, but the, the silver price hasn't moved. And you're telling me all this demand's going on. You and just... we, we, you know, we, we've, we've, I've, I've listened to yourself included, you know, people talking about the way in which 
gold is being repatriated by nation states, Russia, China, and and you know, and smaller states besides are, are trying to get their hands on as much gold as they can. You know, is is that happening in the same way with silver? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the thing is, the Bank of England and the Fed, they, they don't have huge reserves of silver like they do gold. Um, the Russians, obviously, like I said earlier, are starting to stockpile it. So are the Chinese. What's really interesting, actually, is India. They're adding to the squeeze and they're doing so to, to a huge extent because they've got history of doing that, actually. Um, and what's really interesting is the supply, sorry, the demand from India alone, Neil, could wipe out the silver vaults in less than a month. So they just bought over 800 million ounces in the last two years, which is what we supposedly hold here in London. Um, it's the entirety of the LBMA's vault. So silver imports, I think, in the first uh, six months of this year um, jumped to over 4,500 tonnes. And that was up from 560 last year, which was also a record, Neil. It's up seven times in a year. So they are. They're repatriating it. Yes, the Indians in particular. In India has seen a huge surge in their middle class, fueled by all this outsourced labor, um, which is lifting millions out of poverty, which is great. Um, and as their purchasing power increases, they're embracing all the modern conveniences, all the mod, mod comms like air conditioning, washing machines, fridge freezers. Last year, only 5% uh, of Indian households had, had air conditioning, Neil. India is a pretty hot country, so they're going to require a hell of a lot more um, silver just for their power grid. S Silver's the number one conductor of electricity. What what else can do that? Nothing. It, it, it's and there are so many ways to think about it. You know, when you contemplate, say, cryptocurrency, and for, and you know, if, let's just say Bitcoin for as a shorthand for cryptocurrency. But the, the, we know that the mining of the the the, the summoning into being of of Bitcoin takes enormous amounts of energy. Mm -hmm. And that energy is conducted in large part, as far as we know, by silver. <laughs> so you think, why are you bothering to consume all the silver to make the Bitcoin when you could just have the silver? You know, it kind of, it shortcuts that. you Because you, ultimately, you, if you don't have silver, as far as you understand it, you can't make Bitcoin. No, absolutely. So just, so just have silver. Ticket it's a chicken and egg just go straight to the source uh -huh. uh, yeah we, we let's touched make upon that Bitcoin. let's use that let's use that to make that well you you started out with the silver just you know hold oh, that exactly Neil. and people people are saying oh there's going to be bitcoin wars throughout all these different nations let's look what the nations are actually doing i think we're actually going to experience silver wars between oh. industry sectors, military, aerospace, solar, electrical engines, all competing for this number one conductor of electricity. So without it, you don't have any cryptocurrencies, none of them. Uh -huh. You know, all the people that are holding whatever modest or vast wealth in the form of Bitcoin, if there's no silver left to channel the electricity, they're, they're not accessing that. That's that store of wealth, are they? You're not getting any of it, no. Without the electricity, without the silver, there's no electricity. Without the electricity, there's simply no Bitcoin. But they'll, 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 the Bitcoiners, they're so partisan, obviously, with everything that they do. And yes, I also am a fan of it to an extent. But they, they, they think silver's a relic. They poo-poo it. Oh, I don't, why, why do you want to bother with that? But it just takes a bit of digging to realise what's going on. So and they're all d distracted. Let's 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 put no, let's let's. Uh, I think we we almost skirted over. Um, let's just uh, I investigate a little bit in, in a little more depth what's happening with the world's attention and the military industrial complex's attention on Mexico. Let's mm. just say. I mean, let's just you know what wh what else are you are you are you reading around and 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 hearing talk of in that context that. That for any other any other reason, if people say if you know if 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 such and such a you know a, a high minded uh, body is going to tackle the, the the Mexican cartels because they are ISIS, how much would the story be altered by by thinking hmm, actually it's not about that at all because it, it never is it never is never about what they say it's about ever is that, that you can go back to Iraq Afghanistan and. I don't want to dig too deep on that now, Neil, but 
it is never about what they tell you. And they'll mm -hmm. always implant a seed into your consciousness years before it happens and start building up these narratives. So by the time they come to do it, everyone's absolutely convinced that there are weapons of mass destruction over there. What a load of rubbish. Nothing found at all. Same thing's happening here. And I know we've now got this kind of left-wing WEF politician in charge that's uh, <laughs> best friends with all the, the major bankers. But before that, there, there was a pretty nationalistic um, president and he was gathering so much support. And I think that's why we were seeing all this saber rattling and rhetoric. And I, if if she hadn't have come in and AMLO would have stayed there, it wouldn't surprise me if Trump would have done something. This is only two you months are, ago. You 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 we, so we watch Ukraine, you know, where where the ordinance is being detonated, and we we'll, you know we look at other places, hell hellscapes around the world, you know, in the Middle East, in in Gaza, and so on, and. You, and rightly so, we should be paying attention to those things for all sorts of moral and ethical reasons. But that's just, that's where the military industrial complex is detonating its ordnance, thereby, thereby creating the demand for the replacement of its own product. The whole, the whole exercise begins to look so incredibly cynical. There's no, I know there's a danger of just becoming too cynical about it, but it's just a reality. Just open up your eyes and realize what's going on. There is no end to their greed, their shamelessness. They know exactly what they're doing and they just don't give a damn. They really don't. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been just in the last 24 hours, I've been wondering, you know, if, uh, all this speculation that, 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 uh, that Donald Trump will say, as, as he said in, in all the rhetoric beforehand, that he would switch off the war and, Ukraine overnight. Yeah, only to go and start another one with Iran. <laughs> I mean, it's just all a game of chess. I know. That worries but... me more than anything with him in charge. Look, I, I'd obviously much rather have him than Kamala. Clearly a, a, a total and utter psychopath. But even he is, the, you look at the influence that APAC have over uh, his, his squad that he's elected and you think, oh God. <laughs> How long but, is it until they but, end up in a war with Iran? I don't know. But, and when, when you start when you start looking at, at Ukraine, what we know about it now, that you know, the all the way back to at least twenty fourteen and the US led coup that provoked the civil war, which then eventually drew Putin's Russia in, you know, in in, in twenty twenty two. And by now and as you mentioned earlier, you know, Boris Johnson being sent out as the bag carrier for NATO to scupper the peace deal so that they can keep detonating the ordnance, so that they can keep vaporizing the silver, so that they can maintain the demand for their hellish products. Mm -hmm. Now, if if a phone call takes place that says, you know, we've we've squeezed every last drop of juice we're gonna get out of that benighted territory in Ukraine, and we're just going to move on from that. The, the you know the 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 explicit and unbearable nature of the loss of human life there. You know the hundreds of thousands that have been pushed through that meat grinder. If if the military industrial complex just decides to move on, you know what what an indictment that will be on the species n n never mind anything else you know do they do they just go oh well yeah we'll just stop now uh we'll draw another line on a map we'll say that that's now ukraine and this is now a part of the of uh, greater russia and uh we'll let the grass grow on those graves and we'll just move on absolutely that's why they're buying up all the land out there now again no one's talking about that yeah. Buying up all the land. I'm on Sato buying huge amounts of land in Ukraine. Hmm, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Why do you want to do that? Yeah, they the rich the black of the, world. the rich black <laughs> soil of of Ukraine. Exactly that. And look, even the banks realise going back to silver, what's going on there? If you look at J.P. Morgan in particular, there's estimates that people have been talking about this for decades, by the way. But they reckon they've got about 850 million ounces of silver, the largest private stockpile of silver in the world in their warehouse. Uh, and this is just based on interpretations of data and monitoring their, their activities, etc. Um, 
people people going back to you and me one rule for thee one rule for me the hunt brothers do you remember it near in the 80s I, i'll be honest yeah. with you refresh everyone's memory about that Nick. well they attempted to to corner the silver market in the 80s with their family fortune and the price soared by over to, like, like i said two thousand percent the reason they failed though is because they piled that family fortune into paper contracts rather than the physical, which obviously enabled the government to step in and bankrupt them. They lost everything. But the banks now seem to have learned from this. The, the canary and the coal miners started to sing and they're thinking, OK, we've now got to amass the physical before we're ready to, to revalue it. Um, it. It's as clear as night follows day. They're all so interconnected. I mean, we've only scratched the surface, uh -huh. you know, but it, 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 it's blatant. The, the 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 extent to which I mean, you talk about the media not reporting it, but th that general ignorance, and I, I'm not using ignorance in any sort of pejorative sense. It's just people not being invited to know. I mean, no. Broadly speaking, people don't know what they're not told. You know, it's not the fault of, of people have busy lives that they're getting on with. But if the if the world was to be if the if the populations of the world were to be invited to see the world through these commodity uh, focused eyes. You, you know, once you once you start coming to terms with the idea that there's 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 a certain amount of gold, there's a certain amount of silver, and, and they have their applications and their uses, and there's you know there's oil, which which, which may be abiotic and endlessly replacing, or 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 it may be a finite resource. Uh, you know I don't know the answer to that that question. You know there's food. You know there are these basic commodities, and when you take the politics out of it, and you take the the red hot emotions that that get whipped up in one place or another, and you think it's just cynical transnational corporations maximising the return on trading fraudulently in most cases with finite resources. That's all it is. Yeah. It's distracting the masses with bread and circuses, of course. I mean, the Romans always used to do that. Read a world for sale. That's a brilliant book. You probably already read it, Neil, but it's I all haven't about read that one. And the, these guys, they control both sides of the political narrative. It doesn't make any difference to them who they who gets in. They just don't care. That's just there to distract you and me. Do you feel do you feel a sense that this is coming out? I mean, I, I'm very careful all the time because I was asleep for the longest time and I've become awakened to certain uh, you know, truths. And I have to restrain myself from being instantly frustrated with all yeah. the other people that, that aren't paying attention yet, because I didn't pay attention either. You know, so you just have people, people become aware or, or they don't, and they, be, they become aware of things in, the, in their own, in their own time. But, you know, if, if do, you, do you think that there isn't a, a, a broader awakening it's not, I mean, obviously I'm thinking right, everybody must see this now because I can see it, but sadly not. Yeah, you can lead a horse to water, can't you? You just can't make uh -huh. a lot of people drink. They've got to find it out for themselves and you just can't go in and get too passionate about it, as tempting as it might be, because mm -hmm. it puts a lot of people off and then they'll double down with the narrative that they've had drilled into their head. Um, but yeah, like you said earlier, it's lying by omission. They won't directly lie. Well, they do. <laughs> but a lot of the time it's just about keeping things away from, from the general populace and distracting you with silly things that aren't going to impact your life whatsoever. We've also got to sort of try and help help people make decisions that are within their reach. You know, and it sounds as though, you know, in, we've talked about investing in gold and why it, it fixes value, but, but it almost sounds as if it, it should be more about silver almost. Look, I'm, I'm for the, just for, the, for every man, for if, you know, for every man and any man that's got, you know, that's got any savings or whatever. Yeah, it, it sounds like even more than gold, silver. Is it? Is that right? Is that the right interpretation for a small, for for an, for an every man? Well, it's volatile, Neil, because obviously they are manipulating it. And whenever you see volatility, that's the reason why a lot of the time. So for anybody that hasn't got the stomach for it, I'd say, no, don't buy silver. Stick with gold because it's got the proven mm -hmm. track record. But if you're feeling a little bit more adventurous um, and in the next, I don't know, you've got the luxury of holding this for two, three, four, five years plus and riding out this inflationary storm and everything that we're seeing, absolutely get some silver as well. Even if it's just 10, 20, 30 percent of what you intend on putting in. 
um, it, it will rise. It's going to go up. It is going to revalue. We just don't know when. If you're looking at making a short term buck, no, one hundred percent not. Surely they can't. Surely they. Surely whatever that those institutions that are that are profiting hugely from from manipulating the price. If we are, as and I've, if you are, if you're right, and we're oper- we're dealing with a finite resource that is being consumed and that the, the world, the military industrial complex and others are so hungry for, mm. then, you know, when there's only 10 ounces of gold left in circulation, can you suppress the value of that 10 ounces when it's all there is? Surely there comes a, break, a, a tipping point where its actual value relative to everything else must become apparent. Yeah, that's what we're starting to see now. It, it will break out. There's only so long they can keep a lid on it for with these paper contracts till the game's up. And it will. It will revalue. Does it every time in history. Um, and they, 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 people have broken the lid on this many a time. When did your um, awareness of all this kick in? You know, you are now, you know, Nick Ward, co-founder of Bullion Partners and all the rest of it. Clearly, you've made a decision about oh, how you understand no. the truth of things. But how did? What was? Mm. What was your voyage of discovery? Um, I worked. I was a lawyer originally, actually, which I hated, really boring, just part of the matrix, really, in the system. Then I worked for a couple of financial companies, realized that the whole system is just inherently corrupt. And then um, I went on to realize that sound money is the actual only thing that exists, is the only thing that's truthful, the only thing that's real. And that's why I I got into Austrian economics, if you like, instead of this Keynesian system that we're currently living in, which is just make-believe. None of it exists. None of it's real. It's just about control. Control, 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 control. That's it. So that, yeah, that long story short, I never, I suppose, initially went out to think, you know what, I'm going to found a gold company. No, I didn't. I was naturally led there. I've always known what's been going on in the financial markets for 12, 15 years. But to every other rabbit hole that I've been down now, that was just, I suppose, pre-COVID, you know, over the last five or six years, do you actually start to realize how interconnected everything is? You can realize what's going on with money, the banking system, the establishment of the, the Federal Reserve, um, the creature from Jekyll Island. That was one of the first books I actually read that, that got me onto this. You, you probably read that one, Neil. But that really opened my eyes. And from there, it's just a, a never-ending pit of discovery, I suppose. I should have asked you this. I can't remember if I asked you this question in our first conversation. And if I haven't, I should certainly have asked it earlier. But here, right, it's occurred to me now. Is, is silver more useful than gold? Absolutely. I mean, gold is used for a couple of things. It's, uh, so it, so it, why is, you know, so the, this perpetual, uh, never-ending, immortal value of gold is mm. an interesting one. I mean, obviously, it's, it has rarity. It has rarity value. But if it has fewer applications, and silver is this enormously flexible, a- applicable element, you know, it's like yeah. the disparity between, you know, if it's 16 times difference, and, it, and it, at least, and it, uh, you think almost, it should, shouldn't it tip the other way? <laughs> Silver. <laughs> that, silver should be gold, and gold should be silver. Yeah, the ratio now of silver to gold in the ground is about six to one. It was usually much, much wider than that in the past, but the price of it hasn't broken out. Look, there's a a hell of a lot less gold. Um, So I'm certainly a big advocate of gold. Mm. Keep more of your portfolio in it because it's only going to do one thing over time. And when things revalue, that's also going to jump up dramatically. Um, But silver's like gold on steroids. When gold goes up 10%, silver will go up 25% and vice versa. So that's why I say... If you've got the luxury of sitting on it for the long term, absolutely add some silver. But for the short term, your safe bet is definitely gold. Nick, it's endlessly fascinating talking to you, and we will definitely continue to have these conversations. Um, but I, the, I love the way in which, it, ostensibly, a conversation about you know a, an element on the periodic table spins out into geopolitics <laughs> and and is connected to, to everything else on the planet talk about conductive <laughs> it, it's it's <laughs> what a brilliant way to end it neil yeah <laughs> but we will we will we will talk more um <laughs> after gold then silver whatever will we talk about next the oh i can think of plenty of things <laughs> nick ward gold billion partners a thousand thanks again that oh, was thanks worth, very that much, was worth its weight in gold thank you <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks, Neil.